Hi, and welcome to the presentation, Bridging Security Infrastructure Between the Data Center and AWS Lambda. As you all know, serverless is all the rage, but creating secure infrastructure that integrates serverless technology with existing data center services remains a challenge. And we'll talk today about how to overcome these. So uh, to give an overview, uh, first we'll talk about background and context, then the goals we want to achieve in this talk, and then about the two solutions we implemented. So the, the first one is going to be how we made uh, enable Lambda to call into the Envoy service mesh. And the second one is how we keep application secrets in sync between the data center and Lambda. We'll close with some key learnings. Briefly about myself, uh, I'm Michael Weisbacher. I work on the infrastructure security team at Square in New York. I've been there for three years and I work on a sub team that is working on cryptographic identity and secrets management. And before that, I was doing security research and getting a PhD at Northeastern University. So some background. Let's first talk about the benefits of serverless and Lambda specifically. It lets developers focus their attention on business logic and not worry about infrastructure too much. It is handled by AWS Magic. Also, it's fast. Lambdas have very fast response times. But they're not only fast, they're also very scalable. And an underappreciated feature here is scaling down. Workloads that are not needed anymore will be automatically deallocated. There is no need to maintain idle servers. What is also great is how well connected Lambda is with the AWS ecosystem. It is possible to trigger Lambda via an S3 write, an email, or many other options. So the big question is, of course, how does it all work? These functions are code without assigned infrastructure. Lambdas are running on small VMs on Amazon Linux. They use Firecracker VM and the Lambda sandbox to achieve speed and scalability. When invoked for the first time, a Lambda performs a cold start. These take a bit longer to allocate infrastructure. But once this happens, additional invocations can reuse state from previously invoked Lambdas. And when a Lambda stops being invoked for a while, infrastructure is automatically unassigned. I showed you the good sides of Lambda, but what we learned quickly is what makes Lambda attractive also makes it incompatible with DC infrastructure. There are several reasons. Lambda workloads are short-lived as opposed to long-lived workloads in the DC. The deploy process here is different. Infrastructure is assigned ad hoc, much differently than in the DC, where server nodes are assigned ahead of time. Also, speed and scalability are core features of Lambda. After a cold start, a Lambda is expected to respond near instantaneously. Security infrastructure can't slow down or block the hot path of responding. Also, infrastructure that is not highly available would uh, jeopardize this property. And now, about the goals we want to achieve. To achieve higher flexibility and scalability, Square has been moving to the cloud. Lambda plays a role in that, but Lambda can't be an isolated island. What we needed is for Lambdas to be treated the same as other workloads. In the DC, we have a Kubernetes-like platform, and in AWS, we have Kubernetes running on top of AWS EKS. We connect these environments with an Envoy service mesh to connect services to each other. What we want out of Lambda are two things. One, they should be able to communicate securely with any application connected to the mesh. And also, we want to access application secrets, which are in a DC-based system. To break this down into two top-level goals, we want Lambdas to be treated equally as other workloads. We also want to keep the benefits of Lambda intact. So more specifically, functionality that we want is to communicate with Envoy Service Mesh and have access to application secrets. 
but we also want to maintain important features, such as response time and scalability. We also want to be compatible with our DC infrastructure, and obviously availability can't be degraded by our security infrastructure. So, part one, calling into the service mesh from Lambda. To give a motivational example, consider two services in the DC, Square DC, service one and service two. Service one is calling service two, and service one turns out is a bursty workload. So once a week or once a month, it has a high load spike, and otherwise these servers are idle and not doing much. So this is a perfect candidate to move to Lambda. But once it's in Lambda, it still needs to call service two. And this is the interesting part now. So for service two, nothing should change. It's, it should still be able to receive calls from service one, where they are in the Square data center or residing in AWS Lambda. We don't want to change the, the code for service two or the infrastructure for service two. It should just work. And how we'll make this work, we'll talk about now. But first, how do services communicate at Square? At Square, everything is a microservice. This predates me, but Square has been using MTLS since 2012. You might know this technology as zero trust networking or identity is the new parameter. What this really means, the network is as trusted as a public Wi-Fi. We don't trust the network and assume it compromised. All trust we have is anchored in identities and everything else is assumed bad. For connecting securely, we use an Envoy service mesh. Services connect in clear text to their Envoy sidecar, which handles the connection. Our workloads are available in Square DCs, but also on Kubernetes on a platform based on AWS EKS. And the way we look at identity is a tuple of service name and environment encoded on their certificate. For example, service one staging or service two production. Enter Spiffy. Spiffy is a workload identity standard that is based on the way workloads have been handled within companies such as Google, Square, and others. The standard formalizes how to tie identity to worklets, wor workloads and how to issue it. There is also a reference implementation for the Spiffy standard, which is called Spire. Square began migrating to Spire three years ago. We did this to move from an in-house built identity issuance to an open source standard solution. We use Spiffy for every service, for every environment where we need service identity. So what do we want identity to look like for Lambdas? Square is using an architecture with many AWS accounts. And the way services are mapped to AWS accounts at Square is the following. Each tuple of service and environment, which I mentioned earlier, has its own AWS account. For example, service one will have different accounts for staging and production. We get nice properties from that. We know that any resource that is associated with a specific account belongs to a certain service environment pair. And this is also true in reverse. What this also means is that all lambdas within a single account belong to a single service. And within each account, we have multiple roles, such as read-only for security checks or an execution role where that we use to run lambdas and a bunch of others. First, we are wondering, can we use what we have in a DC? In the DC, identity is a solved problem and it works well for our long-lived workloads. But there were issues. Spira has no support for serverless and requires an agent to operate. Also, Lambda has no support for sidecars. We were also looking whether we could bootstrap from AWS account credentials. We wanted to externally signal account ownership and identity. A possible solution would be to construct via KMS building bearer tokens. This would have meant sending a signed request. The issue with this is incompatibility with our MTLS service mesh. We wanted to avoid carrying cloud implementation details into the DC. Overall, 
this didn't fit into our architecture picture. Since existing services didn't meet our goals, we decided we should build identity issuance on our own. One big decision we had to make is whether to issue identity in pull or push style. We looked at these two in three metrics. First, what would identity issuance look like? Second, what the secu security aspects were? And also whether there were availability concerns. In the pull model, we would generate identity on invocation. We would have to create a form of agent ourselves. In terms of security, we saw this as equivalent to the DC issuance. In terms of availability, however, we noticed that pull creates a blocking dependency for invocation. Pull issuance is a hard dependency. As for push, we will have to issue ahead of time. Identity would be readily available. This also means that identity will be present even if a lambda is rarely used. What initially, me bo initially bothered me at the time was that push seems a real anti-pattern compared to Spire, which uses pull. But in terms of security, although we were first concerned, we, we then concluded that if identity is tied to access within an AWS account, it is equivalent to pull. We rely here on IAM and SCP. And in terms of availability, push was a clear winner. To summarize, push has no security downsides. It also makes for a higher availability system since lambdas never have to block on identity. Based on that, we decided to go with push. Here are some of the components used in our system. Identity governance and administration is a square internal service. We use it in this context to query for whom to create Lambda identity and receive tuples of service environment and account. Our Asian system generates certificates per service with spiffy URIs. This whole system is also implemented as two Lambdas. We also use AWS private CA. This is an HSM-backed CA that never exposes its root key. And for storage, we use AWS Secrets Manager. We centralize all secrets in one account, and we make identity available via IAM and SCP. So this is what the system looks like. First, let's focus on this area. Identity issuance is invoked on a cron schedule, so we get an invocation every 15 minutes. And the first thing that happens here is that the system connects to the IGA service and receives a list of all services that should receive Lambda identity. Then the system retrieves from Secrets Manager all previously issued certificates to compare with the IGA response. What we check for is um, any certificate that would be expiring or app newly added applications. We issue certificates for 24 hours and refresh at half-life, so anything that is older than 12 hours here would be refreshed. Those applications that need to be refreshed, we create a CSR and private key. The private key we write to Secrets Manager with the correct permissions, and the CSR we submit to AWS PCA API. This is where the first Lambda exits. Now let's focus here. This is now another Lambda that is subscribed to AWS PCA um, events. So whenever a certificate is issued, this Lambda is being invoked with that certificate. And all this Lambda does is store these in Secrets Manager with the correct permissions and exits. Now let's focus on this Secrets Manager. So this is the same Secrets Manager that we'll see in the next slide. It is a centralized resource. So coming back to the motivational example, service one now exists in Lambda and wants to call service two in the DC. On startup, its Lambda layer reads the private key and certificate. Next, it creates an MTLS connection that is load balanced and routed via mesh proxy. And now it can connect to service two again. So, in more detail, how does it work for a Lambda to make a call? 
Fetching the secrets happens in a Lambda layer that our Cloud Foundations team provides. The fetching of identity is automatic and does not require developer work. Next, a program in the layer starts listening on localhost so the Lambda can use it as a proxy to make calls. The layer overloads the TLS verify peer certificate function to perform spiffy URI validation. Important to note here, the operation of the layer is transparent to developers, so all this is abstracted away. Mesh proxy is a modified version of Envoy that does not terminate TLS. A great property here is that it does not need to be trusted as content is encrypted. It receives calls from the Lambda layer and routes by SNI. Based on service availability, the call will be directed to either the DC or EKS. And once the Lambda call arrives at the destination, the call service performs a check against the caller spiffy URI to verify the service is allowed to perform this call. To revisit our goals from earlier, in terms of equal footing, we have so far enabled communication. However, no secrets yet. We were also able to maintain the Lambda benefits. Push style issuance has no startup cost and is merely a secrets manager read. Lambda speed and scalability is not limited. We maintain compatibility by observing the spiffy standard and we are highly available because we don't block. Putting my attacker hat on for a minute. Let's talk about the threats we consider and how we mitigate them. The worst case attack to perform here would be stealing the CA route. In this case, an attacker would be able to issue certificates offline and you will have no way of telling. However, we keep the route protected in the HSM backing PCA. We rely here on an industry standard for protection. If attackers were to break PCA, a lot of other internet infrastructure would be at risk as well. The next option would be to attack the issuance system. Issuance is in a specifically locked down account that is closely monitored by our detection teams. Other than that, PCA has audit capabilities that could serve to alert us to unusual activity. Another option would be to steal identity directly from a Lambda function. We are reducing the value here by limiting lifetime to 24 hours. Also, our microservice ecosystem would limit what services can be called reducing value further. So, access is protected by IAM and SCP. Accessing the certificate requires access to the account in the first place. Overall, we think we are well protected. And this is my favorite part of this project. So, we finished the, we finished the work, we went to production, and we wrote afterwards a blog post about this system. And a month or so later, an RFC was posted to the Spire GitHub account. This was about identity issuance for serverless applications. What was interesting, the RFC picked pull style over push, but what, what we actually learned from our work is that push was preferable. So we got involved in a discussion and advocated for push, for push issu issuance successfully. And now, Work on the implementation has started and Spire version 1.1 will include push identity issuance that is compatible with our architecture. Once it is released, we are looking to migrate to the open source Spire implementation in favor of our in-house development. We are really excited to contribute our learnings to Spire directly. That brings us to part two and how we worked on syncing application secrets to Lambda. To motivate the system, think of an application that operates in a DC. The service has access to a secret which is supplied by a DC infrastructure. The secret is used to access a third-party API. If developers migrate the service to Lambda, they will still require access to the secret to continue being able to make these calls. And how this works, we'll see now. We use keyways in a DC. But first of all, what are secrets? These can be API keys, GPG keys, or other secret contents. The system is open source and available on GitHub. 
we uh, the way we model ownership is by mapping secrets to microservices. And in a DC, we operate the system the following way. We use a parallel PKI to establish trust. So on each node, we run a daemon set that synchronizes secrets. That synchronizes access to all applications secrets on that node. And this is important for later. Also, developers can use internal web tooling in a system that is called Square Console. For example, they can self-serve ad secrets. And one very important feature is to track expiration of secrets before a potential outage happens. So we can alert developers if something is about to happen. We approached the situation with an open mind and performed interviews with developers. One request received was to let developers use a secrets manager directly. They would add secrets themselves and share via IAM. Secrets would be disconnected from the DC completely and this task would be solved. We decided against it for a bunch of reasons. For one, security teams have developed expertise in the handling of secrets. It is our everyday business, a skill that is not necessarily something that all developers have. Another reason is that secrets that need to be available in multiple environments are not updated correctly. We would rely on developers to perform synchronization themselves. And lack of expiration tracking is a potential availability problem, as expired secrets can lead to unexpected outages. Developers will also lose access to other centralized tooling we offer, such as generation of GPG key material. Overall, it would have been too risky and we want to do better. We also considered full centralization, essentially replicating our DC system. Same as for identity issuance, there was no node equivalent, and we also can't block on invoke. Essentially, no infrastructure is available before an invocation where we could assign secrets. So it was incompatible. Neither of these two solutions worked for us, so we decided to build. We wanted features of centralization, but also features of decentralization. We wanted the best of both worlds when synchronizing secrets. Cloud-native reliability with the DC a single source of truth for ease of management. So this project was a great opportunity to revisit how we think of security boundaries for secrets. In the DC, we have powerful synchers with wide-ranging access. For Lambda, we wanted to approach this in a more granular way and reduce blast radius. Also, as Lambda set the concept of node, we had to be creative anyway. And this might seem obvious since we just talked about Lambda identity earlier, but something that really struck us, we already had implemented Spiffy identity. This unlocked for us to communicate with the DC. This was not an immediately obvious approach, but so we wanted, uh, so, so we added Spiffy support to Keywiz, and this enabled us to build a client-side synchro, essentially a sidecar that synchronizes secrets. So we could always keep secrets within an AWS account rather than having to traverse. Another idea was to require opt-in per secret rather than synchronize all our opt-out. This way, we made sure not to overshare secrets. Developers have to be explicit. In terms of availability, an observation we made with Keyways is that secrets are updated rarely compared to how often they are accessed. The majority of syncs is really a no op. So it was more important for us to have a reliable cache over blocking on updates. We also allow developers to trigger synchronization themselves in case they need an immediate update. So for storage, we decided to use Secrets Manager as a cache. We wanted to have fast reads that don't depend on the DC. We also decided to use the default key for encryption. This can prevent out of account sharing. AWS enforces this feature to the default key. Now, the system architecture. On the far right, you can see the deploy artifact. We provide a single centralized artifact that developers can deploy from. Once deployed, as first step, the synchro is invoked on a cron schedule every 15 minutes. Step two, 
When invoked, the synchro makes an MTLS call to queue within a DC. And this is what's interesting, this call is made with the identity of the service in which the synchro runs. And Kiwis knows which secrets have, which, which secrets are available to this service and uh, responds with the metadata of these secrets, so the names and the HMACs of these secrets. Step three, the synchro reads all secrets from its own secrets manager to compare with the metadata from the response. It is essentially a diff operation. And step four, for secrets that require updating, so anything with a changed HMAC or new secrets or secrets that are going away, the Synchro requests secrets contents. And finally, step five, updates are applied to Secrets Manager. So secrets are either created, updated, or deleted. And at this point, the Secrets Manager is in sync with the shared secrets in the DC, and the Synchro can exit. So what does this look like for developers who want to use secret syncing? To install, we offer a Terraform module that can be installed with, with 24 lines. And to access secrets, all that is necessary is to read from local secrets manager, and this can be done with normal AWS APIs. We implemented the system as a Lambda, and we also use workload identity from earlier in the talk to access secrets via SPP ID. In terms of isolation, the secret syncer operates in each account individually that requires secrets. Here's what, assigning, uh, here's what assigning a secret looks like in Square Console. This is a test application. If you look at uh, number one, uh, we have two different secrets here, test secret one and test secret two. Test secret two is already available for Lambda. Test secret one is not, so we want to change that. So we click on test secret one, and then we click on update infras, we're at number two. Then we get the screen which you see below. So we can assign the secret to a different infrastructure and we select Lambda. We can see at the bottom at number three that a change is being applied to make the secret available to Lambda. Then we click Update Assignments, number four, and on the next run of the Synchro, the secret will be available in Lambda. After deploying, the Synchro will show up as a regular Lambda in the service account next to all other Lambdas which are available there. And here you can see that the Synchro is attached to a cron event. The Synchro is invoked every 15 minutes and takes about two seconds to verify that the local secrets are in sync. All of these are no op operations, so we are comparing against keywords that all secrets are in sync. So to revisit our goals, with this project, we establish both goals of equal footing. We can now communicate with the service Mesh. So this is what we had solved in, in part one. And what we serve, solved now in part two is access to secrets. In terms of maintaining Lambda secrets, uh, Lambda benefits, our hot path for accessing secrets only contains a secrets manager read. So we don't block on a DC. And we also remain compatible with centralized tooling that makes secrets management easier, such as tracking of expiration and other features of Square Console. In terms of risk mitigation, the most valuable resource is to gain access to all secrets. This would require either attacking Kiwis or impersonating services. For both, we think Kiwis is secure and we trust our identity system. Another option would be to attack the Synchro. We protect artifacts with a CICD pipeline and we rely on S3 object version to prevent modifications. And finally, compromising individual secrets. Since secrets are strongly tied to identity, accessing secrets via the API would really require compromising our identity system. We are confident in that system. We also further reduce secrets exposure by using opt-in and not synchronizing all secrets automatically. Currently, the system is used in production and Spiff is supporting QAs is in our open source repository, so you can use it too. And for the future, Spiffy work in Kiwis makes, makes it easier for us to move to other environments through interoperability. And now, some key learnings. 
success criteria for us are that both identity issuance and secrets are used in production. This includes Square Financial Services, which is a subsidiary of Square uh, that is a bank. Spire, the reference implementation of for Spiffy is implementing push architecture. We see this as a confirmation of our approach here. So my advisor always used to say to close a talk with three takeaways. So here they are. Your developers will want to use Lambda, whether you plan for it or not. And Lambda has many benefits, but as we learned, it's not compatible with the C infrastructure. But there's a solution, and this solution can be working with other environments. We talked today about how to call into the Envoy service mesh and how to sync application secrets from the DC. Both accelerate development and make things more secure. There are also several learnings for hybrid environments that extend beyond Lambda. Moving to the cloud really means that there will be tricky dependencies. This interim state is quite challenging, and for complex systems, this can last years. Cloud services will rely on the DC, and operability, interoperability is key here. And we found it helpful to use a best of both approach to let environments support each other and avoid blocking. Thank you both for paying attention and also to everyone who contributed. This project involved a lot of people on various teams. Thank you. Also, thank you to the Spiffy community. Working together on worker identity has been fun. We had a lot of fruitful conversations to make identity stronger. The slides will be posted after this talk. I'll also be posting a write-up with more details on Lambda secret syncing. The slides will contain links to reference material. I'm ready to take questions now.